All right. Okay, so last week we talked about um, the purpose of morality and the purpose of the moral life was to be happy. And we talked about how the Catholic sort of understanding of ethics is uh, a virtue-based ethics. So in other words, it's, it's about um, what those actions that make us thrive as human beings are what we call good, and those that harm us um, to getting our destination we call bad. So this week, we're gonna kind of lay down some fundamental moral principles before we move into um, specific applications with the Ten Commandments um, in two weeks. So where I wanna to start today though is to, for us to reflect a little bit on freedom. So last week we talked about uh, us grasping that freedom is for something, right? Freedom is not an end in itself, but, but it's the means or the, the sort of the engine or the fuel by which we get to heaven, right? So how we're gonna be judged on how we use our freedom. We're gonna, we become what we were made to be by using our freedom the way we're supposed to use it, right? There's a flip side of that, of course, um, and that we always have to do things to protect our freedom, right? And I think I used the example of when the Israelites were in the desert, God gives them the 10 commandments when he does very, um, you know, very intentionally because they're trying to give away their freedom again, right? They're complaining about being in the desert and starving and they're thinking, well, Egypt was way better than this, right? So slavery was better than this. And so God gives them the 10 commandments to remind them that you never want to give away your freedom. And if you follow the 10 commandments, you never will give away your freedom. But all throughout history, right? We said to have the Jews like to read the Exodus, uh, read all spiritual life in terms of the Exodus, all throughout history, we're always, our freedom is always um, at risk or uh, for being given away or being stolen, all right? And our, so our time now is no different than any other time, okay? And there's, there's a distinct attack on freedom um, and not just in the sort of the tyrannical sense, um, but now it's more of a, uh, just the idea that man is a free being, okay? And so what I, wanna, what I wanna do is sort of look at the subtle ways in which uh, our freedom is taken away from us, all right? And so the, the Second Vatican Council um, has a whole section on human freedom. Um, and one of the things that the Council Father said is that authentic freedom is an exceptional sign of the divine image within man. And so what are, the, what are the practical implications of that? All the ways in which we image God, the devil wants to take from us. That's essentially what it, what it is, right? Because that's the, fun, the fundamental temptation for Adam and Eve, right? Is you will be like God's. It was a lie because they already were like God. Um, and so the devil will always use the spirit of the world to take away those things that, that are reflections of the divine image in us. And freedom is one of those things. So let's talk about a little bit about ways in which we give our freedom away. Slavery to sin, obvious one, right? What might not be so obvious though is how many of you saw, it was, I think maybe it was Friday, that the CDC came out with this list of ways you're supposed to address people like, Criminals, for example, right? Where you're supposed to call them like justice involved persons, right? Not criminals, but justice involved persons. And we have to think about that for a second about why, um, how uh, things like politically correct statements like that actually rob us of our freedom because their attempts to rob us of responsibility, right? So immediately you think, oh, this person was some victim of an injustice, right? Not responsible for what they did, but some sort of victim, okay? And so when we do that, um, and we do it in all different kinds of ways, right? We talk about people being victims of their biology or their, their makeup, right? Rather than, um, and those things may be true, are victims, but victims never embrace their freedom, right? And, and it's only by taking responsibility that we can truly be free. The second half of that, right? So, so the, that subtle attempt to take away this idea of being responsible for the things we did, right? The second half of that is that while at the same time, we still go around blaming people for things, right? You blame, like, you blame the shortstop for making an error. You blame, um, you know, you blame the president for X. You, you blame, 
we're, we're all all the time blaming people, right? Which says that there's some level of responsibility for, for what's going on. Um, and a lot of that is that there's a, there's a hesitancy for us to, to call someone bad, right? And what I mean by that, that is that, yeah, naturally there's no bad people, but there's people who do bad, bad things and that turns them into something, right? And they're not irredeemable, they're not beyond that. But if we never get to the level of responsibility, they can never get to the level of repentance, right? And so we have to recognize all the ways, right? a person who never takes responsibility because they've labeled themselves in some way as a victim, right? Never gets to Jesus, right? What do they have to go to Jesus for, right? Jesus who hung himself, who was hung on a cross as, a, as the victim so that we didn't have to play the victim, they never get to Jesus, right? And so it first starts with responsibility, right? And, and embracing freedom, right? And hidden in that then is the idea that, that there's consequences to that freedom, right? And this is where the catechism starts. Freedom makes man a moral subject, right? So he can be praised or blamed because he chose something freely. And only those things we choose freely can we be, be praised or blamed for. When he acts deliberately, man is, so to speak, the father of his acts. Human acts, that is, acts that are freely chosen in consequence of a judgment of conscience, we're going to talk about that in a second, can be morally evaluated. They're either good or evil. Right? So these, this, St. Thomas talks about the difference between what he calls human acts, which they're talking about here, and acts of man. Okay, So human acts are those things we do freely, right, with knowledge. Human acts are things done by a human being, and the difference being breathing. right? Is, is breathing something you just do because you're human? Or is it, is it a moral choice? Okay, so the, those, are, those are the distinctions. So we're, we're only uh, sort of morally responsible for those things we choose. Yes, Connie? Yeah, Michael, I said, you said you're thinking naturally bad, like, like bad, right? Um, so, so hidden in this, right? Like, and this is where we're gonna start. We're gonna talk about conscience a little bit. Hidden in this is that we all have this sort of deep abiding sense of things we ought to do, right? And we can't get away from it no matter how we do it. And that's the realm of freedom, right? Freedom is connected to what we ought to do. All right, so let's talk about why conscience matters then. John Paul II in uh, Fides et Ratio, he says, regrettably, it must be noted, scientism consigns all that has to do with the question of the meaning of life to the realm of the irrational or imaginary. And since it leaves no space for the critique offered by ethical judgment, right? So, so this notion of looking at things clinically and, and, and only psychologically and only scientifically is really an attempt to get us out of the realm of freedom. And since it leaves no space for the crit critique offered by ethical judgment, the scientific mentality has succeeded in leading many to think that if something is technically possible, it is therefore morally admissible, right? And this sort of thinking, it's, it's what's called scientism. What this sort of thinking infects our own thought, right? Where we think, well, if God allowed the invention of a machine gun, therefore it's moral to use it however you want, okay? And so just because something is uh, technologically possible doesn't mean it's morally permissible. In fact, technology ends up being in some ways a way that our freedom is robbed from us, right? Because what, what's the purpose of technology? Why do we have, why do we have technology? Make things easier, uh, yeah, but is that, is that necessarily a good thing? How do I evaluate whether technology is good or not? It, well, ultimately, yes, does it help you get to heaven? But even on a human level, if the,
Okay. Hopefully that works. All right, so uh, a while ago, um, there was in North Carolina, um, some of you probably may or may not remember this, there was a, an amendment uh, that was gonna be added to the state constitution about gay marriage. Um, and there was a, a debate in the News and Observer over uh, gay marriage in general and then where Catholics stand. Um, this was 2012. Um, and uh, one of the uh, participants um, who is nameless uh, said this, she said, yet yeah, one of the best kept secrets in the Catholic church is that like the general public, we Catholics can choose whether to follow our leadership on these issues. The church's own teaching bound in the catechism states that we are obliged to follow faithfully what we know to be just and right. A human being must always obey the certain judgment of his conscience. Vatican II, the US bishops and the Pope John Paul II among others have echoed this primacy of conscience. What is wrong with that? Anything, if anything. Okay. Okay, so what, what, let's start with what's, what's true. What is, because what always happens is truth gets distorted. What's true in what she said? Go ahead. Okay, that is true. What's false? Go ahead, Katie. No, go ahead. while there are times in which we can recognize that our leadership is not following the teachings of the church or stating something infallibly against what the church has taught, in that respect, we're called not to follow our leaders. But outside of that, our leadership should be formed enough in the, you know, the Okay, so, so there's that. There's a sort of self-contradictory uh, method. And then, I mean, understanding, but there's also, I mean, at the very beginning, um, there's uh, just a logical fallacy, right? She said, the church, she cites an authority and then says, you don't have to listen to the authority, right? So that's the first, first problem, right? Keegan, what, what else? The correct way to look at it, from my understanding, is that we are bound, to, we are obliged to follow what we know to be right and just. As Catholics, we know to be right and just that which the church teaches is valid. And so, if you don't believe that, and in fact believe the opposite, you're obliged to follow that because, like, I mean, you can't even not follow that. But you, like, if you're saying you're a Catholic, then you're admitting that you know these things that the church teaches in value to be right and just, and thus your conscience needs to be oriented towards that. And if you're outside of the church and have a different perspective of what is right and just, you need to, you're obliged to both follow that and to check it and to make sure that and everything that you know is like, like you're pushing yourself to not just follow what you think is a good idea, but that everything that you experience in your life tells you that this is the right thing. And you need to push that and push that and then eventually end up in the Catholic Church. <laughs> <laughs> Katie, what were you going to say? Mm -hmm. 
Okay, what about you, Connor? So, so we're, we're getting around, we're getting near a, like a, a succinct answer. I guess I'm going to have you and come back to me because I don't have two different questions. Okay, you want, you want to hold the question until we, until we nail down, until um, we nail this lady to the wall? Yes, Ryan. Well, there are ways that the way it's phrased, it makes it sound like the church doesn't have a specific teaching. It just kind of fits as like all eight mentions, which we've been saying, yes, it's true, but like, I don't know necessarily the tendency of conscience, Trump's church teaching and doctrine, but there's specific church teaching and doctrine. Okay, so we're, 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 we have a problem with the term primacy of conscience. What else, Andrew? Well, I think the primacy of the law to that's what I think so, but like basically the intellect shouldn't like just override and shut down your conscience, but then if like, your conscience tells you, but like if your conscience contradicts like what the church teaches dogmatically, then like you, you, you shouldn't be okay with that. Like it's your job to figure out why and fix it, basically. Okay. Yes, Megan. <laughs> basically, like, this is the whole thing just saying, like the, the basis of this entire argument is that your conscience has to be well formed. But how can your conscience be well formed if you're not listening to it? It's not willful. So therefore, all of this just kind of tunnels to this. How do you know it was right and just if you're not going to know what it's like to it? Yeah. Yeah. So so all of you sort of have kind of hovered around. So she what she's doing is saying conscience trumps all. Right? Conscience, conscience. In fact, that term primacy of conscience, you'll never find it anywhere in a church document. She made it up. But she's not the only one who made it up. I mean, they, this is a thing that people you will find. And ultimately, what they're trying to get at is I am the ultim, ultimate arbiter of what's right and wrong because my conscience says so. It's like what's true. It's not even what's right and wrong. Yes. Yeah. 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 And which is what you were sort of getting at, right? It was like the truth is what trumps all, right? Yes, Connor. So I guess two, two questions about that. Number one, I'm, I'm super proud of getting this, but yeah, can we give a good solid definition of what is conscience? Because oftentimes what it mm -hmm. comes down to is, you know, I have the compassion, you know, the compassion wisdom that makes me feel better and therefore that's what I think is right and not necessarily I've reasoned from, you know, the, the fundamental nature of man up to like the second. And then the second thing is, and maybe you just kind of just school, is why, like, you know, church history is general, why is there, why is it just been this kind of push because you, know, you hear this all the time around like election season, let's say. We see like you need to discern, you need to follow your conscience to like when they're, I mean, just to be polite, like there are people who are you know, supporting abortion, which it's you can never justify that. Yeah, so, so your question is more on the level of like why the movement away from you know, why the movement in, in a time when people we see so it seems the biggest error is kind of a individualistic, like I I want to be able to choose that I'm happy to be in the church. Why are why are our pastors now? Yeah, if you, you remember last week there was a slide. Uh, where we talked about um, somehow you have to bridge law and freedom. And if you don't do it, if, you, if they're not bridged, you'll keep swinging back and forth between them, right? You go, law, oh, that's opposed to freedom. So let me swing back over here. And then freedom is the highest thing. Whereas if, to Keegan's point, if you don't have truth building the bridge between law and freedom, then you will always go one way or the other. So for most people, right, uh, ethics is what we would ultimately call legalism, right? But for other people, ethics is, well, whatever protects my freedom. And which we, you know, radically get to some kind of subjectivism or relativism, right? And so the reason why is that we currently are swinging away from legalism because that was really unpopular because the church overemphasized the law for a while in, in their teaching. Right, and that was mostly in response. But then the church swung back the other way, um, and it's always going to do that until you get in a position where you you constantly build the, the bridge. Like, and that's how ethics should be taught, where you where you hold those two things together, freedom and the law, and you show how there's no contradiction when you talk about the truth of man. Okay. Um, all right, so so Connor wants me to define my terms, which is fair enough. Um, so I'll do that. <laughs> um, so what is conscience? Okay, conscience is a judgment of reason, whereby the human person recognizes the moral quality of a concrete act that he's going to perform, is in the process of performing, 
or has already completed. Um, yes, Connor. So is it, is I feel like you think like, I don't like that definition. Is it, is it so? So people talk about in, in hell the, the, like the conscience is the worm that never dies. Like it just constantly kind of prods you. Um, but they also talk about how people in hell are like always confused. Like they don't have they don't have right reason. Um, is it from this definition? Is it just is it just a particular set of acts of like my my just my? It, it is an act of the reason of your. But is it, is it the same kind of thing as if I you know, make it when this food is, you know, taste good or not? Um, no, so it's a, it's a moral judgment about to the end, end part, right? Something you're going to perform, you're in the process of performing or you've already done. Um, so it's not, uh, it's not a judgment on like, if you were to say, okay, uh, did Hit Hitler kill a bunch of Catholics? I mean, that, that requires a judgment, but that's not a moral judgment, on, right? Or you could say, um, you could even ask the question, well, should he have done that, right? That's still not conscience, right? But, uh, you know, should I imitate him? Well, then that's a judgment of conscience, right? Where now it's, it's a particular judgment on my actions that I'm either going to perform or have performed or in the process of doing it. I guess what, I'm, I guess what I, my confusion comes is there seems to be a, you know, in, in human experience, we talk about like, oh, that person has a guilty conscience. Like it seems to be saying they, they want to escape it. But it's almost they might even be choosing to try to like say it was fine, they're right, it was fine. But they see it almost seems to be like a separate part of like it's separate from their real. Yeah. So so what you're what you're describing, right, is what is the remember we talked about the, the end of the will is the good, right? Well, what's the end of the intellect? Yeah, so so the truth, we always recognize it, right? Like you can't shut down your ability to recognize the truth. You can dampen it, you can rationalize it away but only temporarily right and so conscience always comes back around um because we can't live outside of reality like reality is what it is and if you try to live outside of reality then anytime someone brings you back to reality you get angry at them right like you think about like just telling someone the truth why does that make them angry like why does someone care what i think reality is like honestly like, why does somebody in a, in a gay marriage, why do they care what I think? Why does it matter what I think? Unless what I'm saying is true and it hurts because it, it's always condemning. And what happens is the intellect is meant to grasp onto the truth and it will never let go. It will never let go. And so no matter how hard you try, you cannot shut that down, even in hell, right? So the truth of what God was offering that person in hell the truth of God's mercy will always haunt them, right? They're like, uh, why didn't I just, why didn't I just take the mercy? I just should have took the mercy. I just like, cause it's the truth. Right. And so that's why it never dies. And so it's not, I guess it's, it's not like there's a separate thing that is called a conscience. It's more like it's a, the name applied to a group of, of judgments. Of reason. Yes. A, a, a particular type of judgment of reason. Um, so yes. It's no, it's, it's, it's part of the intellect, part of the intellect. Um, because there is a, there is this danger of hold on one second, Keegan, I'll get to you. There is this danger of thinking it as something else, right? Like Jiminy Cricket, right? Like he's sitting on my shoulder, um, but that's not what it is at all. Even though it feels like an outside voice sometimes, right? Because it's the truth hitting our intellect and and, and crying out for us to live in accord to it. Like God has put that in us, and so it sounds. I mean, like Freud like says it is. Oh, it's an outside voice. It's the super ego. Uh, he and he tries to explain it away. He's like, you just feel bad because your parents taught you that you feel bad about that. I've heard some people trying to explain it. You said it's not explained, but I've heard some people say that it's like the action of the Holy Spirit within the will uh, or within the intellect in some sense. To... Well, I mean, what, I mean, the spirit of truth, yes, right? Like, I mean, that's not, that's certainly, but even people who are not explicitly Christian or like they still have the same pangs of conscience, right? And so, um, you know, at bottom it is the, the spirit of truth um, speaking to you, but it's, it's you know, it's more um, natural than that, I guess, rather than supernatural. Okay. Um, if somebody, like people who don't have a conscience, like you say, serial killer or something like that, is that because this intellect is in the soul, the spiritual faculties, everybody has one, we're going to sing one. So is it, so they're saying it doesn't matter, it doesn't let them make those judgments, or is that like, is that not actually true that they don't have a 
conscience. Mm, it's not true. Like they have a conscience. They found like in the end, right? That they can't shut that off. Um, so they have found a way to dampen it, explain it away, but it still is always there. Yeah. Yeah. And assuming like, you know, like most of those people are mentally ill to begin with, right? So the faculty's probably aren't working correctly to begin with. Like, and so, you know, that's a different issue, but no, you can't, like, they still have a conscience. I guess what you would say there, because I guess there's a possibility or there's the reality that uh, a temporal like this were are, are more likely to have a temporal they, they don't have factors that let them use. If something is wrong in their matter, that doesn't let them use their intellect. Yes, yes. What are you going to say, Keegan? I waited till your mouth was full. I was like, hey, wait, look, you see, to, he's I got a big. I thought that Connor's question was big one. <laughs> <laughs> that never happens, Keegan. What are you talking about? Can you use filters to find content after that, like after in the material world or something? Well, it could be anything. Like in my mind, I, you know, I, I was sitting here going, well, should I wait till Keegan has his mouth full to call his name? Right. That's not really in the exterior world. Right. It's just like, what am I going to apply my will to? Yes. Yeah, but it could be totally like I could have also been judging you for eating, you know, Chinese food. Like, why is that? Dude? Like, not never say anything. Like, it never come out, right? Um. All right. So, is it is it at least the idea of conscience? Is that clear? All right, and then we can we can kind of go back and and uh, there was a there was a second part that I want to point out in this. Notice that there's a modifier in front of conscience, even though. Notice that she says something about certain judgments, right? So whenever you read, um, when the church talks about um, talks about conscience, there'll always be an adjective in front of it. All right, it, it might be right, it might be correct, it might be well formed. You will never see conscience like in a vacuum by itself, all right? Um, so even though she said the primacy of conscience. She then said a certain judgment. Well, how do you get the certainty? Well, let's see, what's, what's a certain conscience? A certain conscience is a state of mind when it has no prudent fear of being wrong about its judgment on some moral issue and firmly decides that some action is right or wrong. All right, so a So if you are, um, and again, assuming no scrupulosity, things like that, assuming a healthy, um, like sort of psychological makeup, um, you never act when you're un like you're unsure, right? So you never act on a doubtful conscience, or you're you're like I don't think that's a good thing. You don't act, right? You get more information, um, and so, so that state of mind that you have no fear of being wrong about the judgment on some moral issue and decides that, that the particular action is right or wrong. Um, so in other words, a certain conscience is one that makes its judgment based on sound reasoning, deliberation, and reference to the moral law, right? Um, and so oftentimes people who kind of lobby for the primacy of conscience really are just, uh, talking about moral opinion, right? And, and they're just sharing their opinion about something rather than the truth. And then that's how we get into rationalizing, right? So in other words, you judge and then you act. You don't act and then go back and look for reasons why it's okay. So just, I guess the, the point about last line then was that um, you cannot have a certain judgment of the conscience if the, if the, resol like the resolution of conscience will always come to the, to the church. So any certain judgment Yes, yeah. And, and it, and conscience isn't, I want, now let me find reasons why it's okay. Like that's the other part of it, right? The judgment comes first, then the actions, because the intellect commands the will to act, okay? All right, and so the, the, the best way to sort of grasp this is to do like a little case study of, of two men, all right? There's this idea that it's, that as long as you're sincere, that's okay, right? I mean, I think we probably all either thought that, hopefully not thought it too much, but heard it, right? So there are, um, so this idea of primacy of conscience. So the, the guy on the right, the guy on the left is St. Thomas More, the guy on the right is Adolf Eichmann, right? 
And Adolf Eichmann, if you know, was uh, by all accounts, not really a great guy. So at the Nuremberg trials, uh, he used the primacy of conscience uh, defense. He said that since his conscience didn't uh, indict him that they shouldn't either. He was just following orders, which is a good thing. What's wrong with that? Right, like why, why does St. Thomas More said the same exact thing? Right? In fact, some people like uh, will call him like the, the martyr to conscience, which is a bad name for it. And we'll talk about why in a second. But why is St. Thomas More a saint? And why is Ad Adolf Eichmann not a saint? Yes, Patrick. Uh, St. Thomas More is a martyr. Uh, he, uh, he had a well-formed conscience. Yes. Is that what you were going to say? Too? I was going to say he's following orders from God. Yeah, the, which is a good way to form your conscience, right? Um, so the point is, though, is that St. Thomas More was a martyr to not to his conscience, but to truth. Right? So, again, truth is what linked him, his free actions to reality. Truth is what linked his free actions to reality. Um, and the other man we say is hideous, right? Because of what he did. Even though he said his conscience didn't um, condemn him and that he was just following orders, right? But if we really believe the primacy of conscience, then we can't make a distinction between these two people, right? If conscience really trumps all things, then there's no way to make a distinction between those two people, what they did. Yes. Yeah, the link is, yeah, it's the link to truth, right? And ultimately, like the end, one was true and good, and true, good, and beautiful, one was not. Um, all right, any, any questions about conscience before we kind of move on? All right, so, so be prepared to be able to sort of defend that idea that the primacy of conscience is a bunch of garbage. Um, and, and sort of hopefully we understand why. All right, now what I wanna do is sort of get down to um, sort of catechism has, uh, this is basically done two different ways. So there's certain first principles and hopefully we know why these first principles are in place um, after we talked about the natural law and human nature and then what are called the moral determinants. So the catechism says some rules apply in every case. One may never do evil so that good may result from it. So even more primary than that, uh, do good, avoid evil, right? That is rule number one. The golden rule, whatever you wish that men would do to you, do so to them. And charity always proceeds by way of respect of one's neighbor and his conscience. Thus sinning against your brethren and wounding their conscience, you sin against Christ. Therefore, it is right not to do anything that makes your brother stumble. What, what does that mean? Right. Our actions need to be, you need to understand that like scandal, for example, is really what they're talking about, right? Because the word st stumble is in Greek of scandal on. What, what makes thing, a thing scandalous is not that like you did something really terrible and people saw it. It's that it makes it seem like a sin is okay. All right, so what, what makes, what, the priestly abuse scandal, scandalous, is the fact that it somehow normalizes something that's not, and that's not good, All right? And so when we use the term scandal, um, at least in a theological setting, it doesn't mean the same thing that we use, like, you know, J-Lo is not with Alex Rodriguez anymore. Um, okay, so, um, so understand that, right? So, so we personally have an obligation like in our actions to make sure we do not scandalize other people, do not lead them even to think, right? Even if you are not sinning, you can do things that are scandalous and make it seem like uh, that a sin is okay, all right? Um, so those are the first principles, right? All right, so how do we actually decide whether something is right or wrong? And this is what we'll spend kind of the rest of the time on. So there are what are called the three moral determinants. And there's actually four, because we, we need to look at the consequences of our actions, but we look at those last after we look at all three of these. 
um, and it's never the primary thing. We'll talk about when it is the primary thing, what happens. Right, so the morality of human acts depends on the object chosen, the end in view or the intention of the, the actor, the circumstances of the action, the object, the intention, and the circumstances make up the sources or constituent elements of the morality of human acts. Okay, so, so those are the three things that we look at when we say that action is right, that action is wrong. And so let's talk about how we look at them. All right, so the first thing we're going to look at is the intention. The intention is why am I doing what I'm doing? So let's read what the catechism has and then we will unpack it. In contrast to the object, which we're going to get to in a second, the intention resides in the acting subject. And that, that part will make sense in a minute because it lies at the voluntary source of an action and determines it by its end. Intention is an element essential to the moral evaluation of an action. The end is the first goal of the intention and indicates the purpose pursued in the action. Okay, so all that's saying is just what I said a second ago about why you're doing something, why a particular action, why you opened the door, right? That's your intention because I needed to uh, let the dog out or I needed to let in a robber, right? The, the why is what matters. Um, the intention is a movement of the will toward the end, right? So what? So the, the intention is, okay, I want to do this thing and, and then we find means towards doing that. Uh, it's just a movement of the will towards the end. It is concerned with the goal of the activity. It aims at the good anticipated from the action undertaken. Remember we, we talked last week about everything we do is always ordered to the good. We move towards something because we somehow think it will, uh, it will somehow fulfill us. Intention is not limited to directing individual actions, but can guide several actions towards one and the same purpose. That is, I mean, it's a little bit obvious, right? So I open the door uh, because I intend to go for a walk because I intend to be healthy, right? And ultimately, the intend to be healthy is the then source of all of those things. And each one of those little individual actions are just means to that end. It can orient one's whole life towards its ultimate end. All right. So first thing, right? We already talked about this last week. We said, okay, we must always intend the good, right? We, we determine something is good for us in some way, even if it, that good ends up being illusory or, or not really good for us. Um, but we always must, must uh, intend what's good. Yes, Keegan. It's impossible not to, right? This is why kind of just, I know I glossed over this really fast, right? This is why, like if the will is made to, to latch onto the good, right? This is why we, like when you're, like when you actually attach to the good, God himself, you're as free as you've ever been, right? Like you're not somehow hampered. Um, all right, so, so we always have to intend the good, um, but good intention is not the only thing we look at, right? In fact, the, the road to hell is paved with good intentions, right? Um, and also a good intention, right? And we're gonna make this distinction several times between objective uh, gravity of, of an act or objective evaluation of a moral act and subjective guilt. Okay, those two things are, can be very different. Right? And we'll talk about all the things that, that mitigate that. Um, so the object, so there is no such thing as a morally neutral act, right? And every time I say that, people are always like, wait, what do you mean? Like, you cannot, you could throw any act out to me and I could show you how it's not morally neutral, all right? Like even down to the cereal you ate for breakfast this morning, right? that was not morally neutral, right? You ate for the end of nutrition, which is a good, all right? Or you ate because you're a glutton and you wanted pleasure. Right. Either way, one or the other, right? Now, why you chose, you know, Captain Crunch instead of Lucky Charms, that, that can be intended too. Like, because I like sugar better than I like, well, actually, that doesn't sugar. I like, <laughs> I like marshmallows, or I'm hoping to find the pot under the rainbow, um, or something like that. All right. Um, so every act we have cannot be morally neutral because of our intention. All right. There's no such thing as a morally neutral act because our intention is either good or bad. All right, so everything I said makes it seem like intention is the most important thing. It is for determining guilt, but it is not for determining whether something is right or wrong. Okay. And so we're gonna, we're gonna now talk about uh, the other parts. Yes, Keegan. 
No, no, like like circumstance, like the depth of. So if I threaten you versus threaten the president, right? The the circumstantial aspect of it, or the the object of my my threat, changes the guilt of it, right? Yeah. Right. Yes. Um, now, if I did it accidentally, like you know, I thought that you were the president or something like that, then you know. Um, I don't, I don't know, Keegan, do you want me to do that? I don't know, you should be thanking me. Okay, sorry. Yes, Mr. President. Careful, you know, there's somebody in this room that got a nickname one time that never went away. <laughs> yeah, I think you might have just got one, Mr. President. Um, okay, so, so what are the other things we look at? Is it okay if I, I move on, Mr. President, can I move on? You okay with that? Okay, good. All right. All right, so what is the object? All right, so the object is actually the first thing we look at, right? And what I want you to begin to think about is the object is the means for carrying out what you intend, okay? Um, so let's read this and then we'll unpack it. The object chosen is a good toward which the will deliberately directs itself. It is the manner of a human act. So what the, what the act looks like sort of exteriorly, if I'm looking at it, me picking up this book, right? That's, that's, an, that's a, an object. Right. I, I can intend to do different things with it. I can intend to read it because my eyes are really bad, or I can intend to, to hit Brennan over the head with it, right? So in one case, okay, good action, reading. Another case, not because of my intention, all right? Um, the object chosen is good towards which the world deliberately directs itself. It is the matter of a human act. The object chosen morally specifies the act of the will insofar as reason recognizes and judges it to be or not to be in conformity with the true good. So is it a means towards carrying out my intention? Objective norms of morality express the rational order of good and evil attested to by conscience. Okay, so this is the, the nature of the act itself. And certain things that we call intrinsically evil can never be ordered to the good, no matter what my intention is. Certain objects can never be ordered to the good. Killing an innocent person, no matter what my intention is, can never be ordered to the good. All right, so if my, my intention is to uh, save my life, then one of the means that I cannot use is to kill an innocent person while doing it. Okay. Even so, the object. Of killing an innocent person is always objectively. So, the moral object, yes, right. Yeah, so hold that. So we're going to actually look at St. John and Mola. That's what we're going to, we're going to unpack her as sort of our moral example of what to do. Um, okay, so, um, so the moral object is one thing, right? So I'm helping a, an old lady across the street, right? Could that, that's at least morally neutral, right? What if I'm helping her across the street because I intend to steal her purse from the dealer's side? That now becomes... Uh, a morally bad act, right? Or I want to come to life and brag about it to you guys. Um, or I want to do it out of a love for God, a love for neighbor. It's a morally good act, right? So the, see how the intention then connects to the actual moral act, okay? And so the same object with different intention can be right or wrong in some cases. And so the reason why we look at the object first then is we say, can that thing ever be ordered to the good? And if the answer is no, then we don't do it. If the answer is maybe, maybe not, then we can do it, right? Then we look at the intention, right? Does that make sense? So this is how we get to moral absolutes because the, the truth is like objectively in reality, like certain things you cannot violate no matter what your intentions are. Intentions are. All right, so we've sort of hinted at this already about whether, um, yeah, I did this last time. I didn't say whether, I didn't say it like that. Um, is good intention enough, right? And here's what the catechism says. A good intention, for example, that of helping one's neighbor does not make behavior that is intrinsically disordered, such as lying and calumny, good or just, right? So the act of lying is objectively wrong, no matter what your intention is. 
The end does not justify the means. Thus, the condemnation of an innocent person cannot be justified as a legitimate means of saving the nation. On the other hand, an added bad intention, such as vainglory, makes an act evil that in and of itself can be good, such as almsgiving. All right, so I choose an objectively good act, but my intention screws it up. All right, I'm gonna talk in a minute about well, what happens when my intention screws it up, what do I do about it? Do I just stop or what? All right, so let's look at circumstances first and then we'll come back to the question. The circumstances, including the consequences, are secondary elements of a moral act. They contribute to increasing or diminishing the moral goodness or evil of human acts. For example, the amount of a theft. They can also diminish or increase the agent's responsibility, such as acting out of fear of death. Circumstances of themselves cannot change the moral quality of acts themselves. They can make neither good nor right an action that is evil in itself. All right, so why do we look at circumstances, right? Because no human act occurs in a vacuum, right? There's always circumstances in which we act. And so those are morally relevant and we need to look at them, right? So St. Thomas says the word circumstance really means something that surrounds the act, okay? Um, and so they're related to the, the, the action sort of as like, like accidents, things attached to the action itself. Um, and so they're, they're, they're morally relevant in some situations, right? You can imagine certain situations where doing something good um, may not be a good idea. Um, but you can also imagine circumstances making it worse, right? Like I already gave the example of threatening King versus threatening the president, but robbing from a church versus robbing from a store, right? Circumstances are different. And so the moral gravity of the act is different. The amount of money I stole also, circumstances different, um, right? But they also um, can affect our, uh, like our involvement in it as well, right? Someone's holding a gun to my head and I do something versus something that I do volition, like fully volitional, totally different, okay? Totally different, all right? Okay, so, so what, let's go back to my question then about uh, what happens when I have, um, so tempted. Um, what do I do when my, my intention is bad even though the thing I'm doing is good? A, mor a morally good act requires the goodness of the object of the end, so end of the circumstances together. An evil end corrupts the action even if the object in itself is good. So what do I do in that situation? What do I do if what I'm doing is objectively good? Like I'm praying before the blessed sacrament, for example. But my intention is to be seen by other people. Do I run out of the chapel? What do I do? Yes, Ryan. Yes. Uh, we, we, always, we always forget this. Like the minute you, this is welcome to fallen like humanity, right? Like the minute we recognize, you know what? I'm not really doing this for the right reason. Guess what you do? Do it for the right reason. Just keep doing it, but for the right reason. Like, don't stop. Like, don't think, don't be so like, like this is where like the practicality takes over of, of like the moral life. Like, don't be so like wedded to, I'm doing something with the wrong intention. I should just stop, right? No, like change your intention. And in fact, the actual, the easier way is to consecrate yourself to Our Lady and give it to her. And then she'll, she'll clean up the mess you've made. Because if you just intend to give it to her, then she, she wraps it up in a beautiful intention and gives it to our Lord. All right, so don't change. If you're doing something good, just change your intention. You can do it at any point. And that's why it's a really good habit to stay recollected and kind of examine what we're, what we're looking at. All right, so what about, I've kind of hinted about this already. What about ignorance? All right, so I probably have shared the story before, but I'll share it again because it kind of illustrates the point. I was talking to a coworker of mine a number of years ago, um, and he brought up contraception, but he, he actually brought up what he called birth control. Um, and he said, well, you're Catholic, you don't believe in birth control. Um, and I said, well, I don't, I don't know what you mean by that. I was like, if you mean contraception, well, we just think it's a really bad idea. And really, really intrigued by that, he says, like, well, what do you mean? And so we talked about it for a few minutes and then halfway through, he tells me I need to stop because I may change his mind, okay? And so what he's thinking is that ignorance is bliss, right? So the question is, is ignorance really bliss? Do we really wanna be ignorant so that, are we, so that we're not culpable for something or what? 
Like, is he really better off because he stopped me from telling him the full truth? No, right? Like, this is something we have to be convinced of, by the way. We absolutely, absolutely have to be. And, and Pope Benedict uses like a beautiful story of the, the gospel where, um, where the workers are in, in the field and some of them go in the morning, some of them go at lunch, some of them go later in the day. And he's like, if we're like the, the people complaining, we think, oh, those, came, those people who came at the end of the day, like they were way better off. They did far less work, right? So much easier for them. And he's like, no, not at all. He's like, what were those people actually doing all day long? They were struggling, not knowing if they were going to feed their family, right? So they sat with utter anxiety for the whole entire day. And then, of course, they were grateful to work even for a few minutes and receive the reward, right? And the point is, is that we, all of us, will always be better knowing the truth and then acting with it. Ignorance is never better, right? And, and that goes for everyone, right? That's why we, we ceaselessly preach the truth to people. Um, but there are different kinds of ignorance, and that's what I want to sort of talk about. There's what's called vincible ignorance. And this is moral ignorance that can and should be overcome, right? So things that we should know that we don't, um, and that would be relatively easy for us to know, right? So simple example, right? I back out of the driveway um, and I don't look and I run over a cat, right? Well, I didn't know the cat was there, but I could have very easily have checked. I could have just looked in my rear view mirror. Um, I could have looked in my side view mirror, just reasonable. Like, okay, so that would be, again, I don't know what the culpability for running over a cat is. Maybe just being sadistic. But nevertheless, like that's a, that's a morally um, culpable action when you don't even try, All right? And so in a certain respect, you're... Um, you're not only culpable for the, the ignorance itself, but the, the result of the action, right? And you think about, we do this with like drunk drivers, right? Like drunk drivers get in the car and they, they hurt somebody or kill somebody, right? We don't just say, well, they didn't know they were gonna run into somebody, right? No, they, they will to do something that may likely lead to that, right? And so when we live outside the truth and don't bother to form ourselves in the truth, we're like, to actually make mistakes um right and then going back to adolf eichmann that's totally him right like oh i was just following orders well, did you check those orders like did you actually check those orders against the moral law um now there's a second thing called invincible ignorance and that's ignorance you could not conquer and thus are not responsible for so going back to my cat example suppose the cat climbs up under the car and is in the engine and i start the car and the cat gets destroyed like, I'm not, in no way am I morally culpable for that, right? Because that's not a, that is ignorance. I couldn't have easily, like, who checks under their engine except, like, James Bond or something, right? Um, be, because that's not a reasonable, like, you can't check all possibilities, right? And so certain things, like, what if I give money to, like, a beggar who's actually a con man? Right? Like, if I did my due diligence to kind of check it out and I gave money, like, that's not contributing to his delinquency, right? All right, so, so ignorance is a, is a real thing. Um, it isn't bliss, um, and, but it, we're culpable for, for our ignorance, right? We may not be culpable for the action that follows, but we're culpable for not fooling ourselves the way we should be. Yes, Ryan? Um, rephrase the question without giving me like the thing you don't want to like rephrase it so that I understand exactly what you're asking. Yeah. So, um, okay. So, so I'm, I'm imagining without throwing anything out there, I'm imagining that you're saying, okay, I didn't know this evil existed and I walked right into it, right? Something like that. Um, it would depend on what the thing was, like, and then not to get into like the, the nitty gritty of it. 
but is it is it uh, is it reasonable to um, to suspect that uh, a mugger is standing around the corner from your house? No, but is it is it you know reasonable to think a mugger is standing um, really anywhere in New York City? I guess. Um, yes, absolutely. You walked into one like that's that's Vince, uh, that is invincible ignorance, right? Like you could have overcome that, right? If you you put yourself in a near occasion of sin and then something happens that you that you are surprised, well, that's probably invincible ignorance, right? Like I had no idea that was going to happen. Well, you kind of put yourself in that, that position, right? Yes, Keegan. Absolutely. Absolutely. Like, so, so that, remember, like that knowledge, thank you, Keegan, that actually, that knowledge, right, that's, that's the knowledge of good and evil that God didn't want us to have to begin with, right? Like to have that experience. That's why, um, well, it's why, like, media is so appealing to people, and why they really want to know how many people died in that, in that train crash, or they really want to know, like, how many people did they blow up, right? It's this knowledge of, of, like this knowledge of evil we should never have like and the way to avoid that is to not be curious about evil like reject the glamour of evil because there's a certain part of us is broken that wants to go yeah i kind of want to see where this ends up like, like resist that temptation resist looking for the, like when you drive by the accident on the side of the road looking for blood right um that's the idea yes megan Yeah, so, so the, good, the name for the good desire is called studiosity, which is a diligent study of things that you should know, right, for your state in life. Um, and so uh, do you need to know, like, I, I, don't, I can't even think of an example right now, um, but you apply yourself, like, do I need to know about uh, canon law regarding uh, priestly interactions with lay people? That's just curiosity, right? That's not helpful. The reason why you don't do that um, is because, um, hang on one second, let me fix this. Is because of the glamour of evil. Like there's something in like objectively evil acts that we're attracted to because of the fall. And so what you're gonna do in those situations, for example, like you're walking through and maybe it's the virtuous act to pray for the dead, but you're going to like naturally go, huh, how many bodies are here? Huh? Like, oh, I wonder how that one died. That looks pretty nasty. Like you're going to do that. That's just the way we're broken. Right. And so that's driven by curiosity. Whereas 
you know what? I know that what happened was horrible. I don't need to see it. I've, there's no, no good comes from me witnessing it firsthand, unless I have to. Yes, Keegan. studying with the purpose and not just studying like sitting down reading a book but if you're looking at something and curious about it with the intention of being better or knowing more about something you need to know it's good if you're just kind of aimlessly going around it's one step away from stumbling on something that you shouldn't know or that could be useful. yeah yeah and it, it's especially bad uh google is especially bad at that right youtube is really bad at it and so like curiosity is a is a is a vice that, especially now, is really it's really important for us to guard against. What are we gonna say, Ryan? To sum it up, Lindsay's looking through the spell book at one point, and one of the spell books is like to see what other people are saying about her. So she reads the spell, and she. Like it's curiosity, it's only curiosity that's driving her to do this. Um, and it started out innocent because she's trying to find a specific spell for reasons that are But she stumbles upon this. And so she like has this kind of view into a carriage with two of her, like a train carriage with two of her friends, and she can hear them. And she overhears one of them talking for the other, and then doesn't hear the and then hears the other one not defend her. And then she gets upset because she's just like overheard this conversation that's to her and just drives her through it. So it doesn't have to be like mm -hmm. the scale of the dead bodies and like that's not the night for example. Stuff like that is very interesting in every day. Kind of causes mm -hmm. What were you gonna say? Can you just like clarify on the term like curiosity and then it's not like Yeah, no, that's we're curious we've made it like really broader than it was ever really intended to be like what i would call that as a child being studious right like wanting to know how something like integral to their world around them works and that's a good thing yeah yes yeah, sir um well so yeah i mean it's don't put yourself like that just, well i mean ask yourself why you have to know like why you have to know things, right? Like, um, I mean, we do this, like one of one of my boys is pretty curious, like like not in a good way sometimes. And we'll, he's always, and, and he has to know everything. And I'm like, the, the first question we often ask, well, we make fun of him a little bit, but like, didn't we tell you? And then he'll go, well, no. And we'll, well that's none of your business then. But what we normally, we, the next question is always, why do you need to know this? Right. So just ask yourself that question. I do that to people. Like when people ask questions, they have no business asking me. The first question out of my mouth always is, why do you need to know that? And I don't mean it in a mean way. I was just like, maybe they need to know it. But normally that's the way to shut it down in your own mind. You're like, wait, why am I looking at this again? And it normally, like, I, I really think like the internet for that reason traps so many men in pornography through curiosity because you are always like one or two or three clicks away from it. Right. And you just go down a little bit of a rabbit hole and there you are. And it's curiosity that led you there. Right. And then to understand like that, there's always an, right. What is, what is the appeal in the fall? What is the appeal to Eve? Right. It's, it's knowledge she was never meant to have. Right? And then that's what actually is appealing to her. She's like, wait, this is secret knowledge that like, and this is why people even like go to mediums, the, why they like do divination, why they do magic, all these things is to capture knowledge. That we have no business knowing. Um, so I, I think we just have to be really careful about like what we, what, why we're doing what we're doing and learning things. Um, so that would be the best way to do it. it would just be to like, when you catch yourself, I mean, I, I've gone down rabbit holes plenty of time. Like, why the heck am I looking at this again? And sometimes it may take me 10 minutes before I get there. I'm like, 
I don't even remember why I started down this thing, but you know, thanks to like clicking away 13 other times, I like, I'm not even close to why I started. Um, so, and the other thing too, I think which we talked about before is like when that, like that little curiosity bug hits you, which is often like just meant to be a distraction. You just basically go, okay, I'm going to wait 10 minutes. And then if I still think I need to know it, I'll go look it up. And normally you'll find you just move down to 13 other things in that 10 minutes. Yeah. Well, you gotta, yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. I mean, and that, like in, in a way, like how does that change anything? Like, does it change? Not, not as if you're indifferent, but you know, something bad is going on. That's probably enough, right? Like, you know, something bad is going on and, and that there's people there that are, that need to be prayed for that are losing their lives. Um, all those things. Like, I don't know how much we need to know that the nitty gritty details of what, what's going on. You gotta say something, Kai. Um, I was gonna, I was gonna say the, the other part, like the term Thomas Price talks about curiosity, and I think we talked some of that on too, where I think it prevents you from fulfilling your stereotypes. So you're, which I feel like probably more people see that as if I'm watching, even about good things. And I mean, I, I wouldn't have expected I was going to do this someplace, but it's, I'm gonna watch, you know, since we I'm gonna watch Catholic Answers for hours at a time. So I'm gonna, I looked up and like, well, I shouldn't do any other things here. Because I was doing, you know, you're looking at good things, looking at religious things, you're looking at just things that are, you know, because they're major or whatever. You're making me remember Tyler. <laughs> remember Tyler? Remember that, Michael? Yeah. But, um, but yeah, but it wasn't actually, yeah. it wasn't actually, it was still curious. Yeah. Um, it's like, I love the liturgy. Really? Yeah, I was on the internet for like six hours. Looking at, I was like, uh, okay. I was like, I was like, there's no problem with that. He's like, oh no, there was a problem. He's like, I spent six hours doing it. I was like, oh, okay, that was a problem. I'll, I'll, I'll grant you that. Um, I have no idea what this recording is going to sound like, by the way. Um, all right, so I said the other thing we need to always look at are consequences, right? And that's sort of how we, we measure uh, another sort of way in which we determine whether we should do something. But the consequences um, are something we look at sort of last when we look at all the things, like not at last as in the sense of after we do them. Um, because there's, a, there's an error that John Paul II talks about, which is called consequentialism, um, which tries to only look at the consequences of an act Williams to draw the criteria, the rightness of a given way of acting solely from a calculation of foreseeable consequences deriving from a, a given choice. Uh, so the, the possible, like, what were you going to ask, Connor, and then we'll just sort of come back to this. Um, I don't know if that's why I was asking you know, but like, ultimately you have the, the air consequences and that are leading to you do evil things that good things happen. But I would say taking a, a you know, farther step back, consequentialism is always, I guess if you look at morality as what is moral is always ultimately the best thing. It ultimately, I mean, ultimately, if you execute consequences perfectly, well, it ends up with the exact same virtue ethics of time as it doesn't, doesn't actually look at the acts. Yeah, well, the, well, part of the problem is we can't see the future, right? So you actually can't see all the consequences from what you do, right? And so when I say to look at consequences, what I mean is to look at the thing and say, okay, what are the reasonable things that will come from this? Right? And then to determine whether I should actually perform this act now or not do it. Right, so like the example always is, how many times did Rosa Parks get on a bus before she decided enough is enough? Right, was she wrong for not doing anything? No, like she said, okay, well the, the consequences are way stronger than the good that will come from this, so I'm not gonna do it. And then at a certain point she said, okay, well I'm an older lady, consequences are way less now, I'm gonna do it, right? And there's nothing wrong with her for going all those years of getting in the back of the bus, but, uh, at a certain point, she said, well, well, either through moral courage or she said, you know, literally to hell with the consequences and she did it, right? Um, so, um, so we always sort of want to measure the consequences against the good that's going to come from it, right? So, so, I mean, a good example is, right? Like your, your friend is really struggling with something. You're like, okay, I really need to talk to them because they're, they're totally out of whack here, right? And then you're like, okay, I'm going to talk to them. And then you find out, oh, wait, like I just found out that, you know, Rob ran over their cat in the driveway. They're really upset. 
And so the consequences of like me talking to them right now, it's not gonna, it's not gonna go well. So I'm gonna wait, okay? That's the idea of looking at the consequences, right? Um, they, they, the act of having that conversation is objectively good, right? But then you're like, eh, well, what are, what's gonna come from it though, right now? Um, and so we have to look at the consequences. Um, but we just have to be really careful about speculating on because we can't see the future, right? And the other, the other error that John Paul II really talks about is that uh, consequentialism ultimately denies the very first thing of objectively evil acts, right? Because what it's trying to do is the ends justify the means. Right? It's sort of like Connor was saying. And so why don't we see if we can come up with an example then um, of looking at consequences, right? And this is the one I sort of had promised, right? So uh, St. John Amola, uh, when she was, you guys sort of know who she is without me giving a whole lot of background. So she was pregnant with her, her fourth child and she developed this large fibroid, which is this, this benign tumor um, that was on her uterus, right? And, um, and so in normal course of events, um, these tumors pop up in pregnancy, they're usually unobtrusive um, and they can take care of them after, um, after the child's born or they just, they just dissolve after the child's born. In her case though, it was large enough that it was likely to cause um, some serious consequences, right? Um, either hinder the development of the child, um, rupture and cause internal bleeding, it wouldn't stop because a lot of blood in the uterus when a woman's pregnant, um, cause considerable pain, even like a really bad infection. So in other words, they couldn't not do, like they had to do something, okay? And so here were the three choices that she was given. The first was to have an abortion, take the child off the uterus and then remove the fibroid. Second was to remove her uterus. Um, and with that would come the child that was attached to it. And the third is to remove the fibroid and continue the pregnancy. All right, and so the first obviously would have saved her life, uh, but would have uh, directly killed the child. Okay, the second would have directly saved her life and indirectly have killed the child. And the third would hopefully save her life and save the life of the child, all right? So treatment, not having treatment, never an option. Um, still risks with the third one, you know, any, any number of things can happen. So, so we'll talk about what she needs. So she chose, but first what I wanna talk about is uh, the principle that she would use in order to decide what to do. Right, so this is called the principle of double effect. Um, so here is, here is the principle. Uh, it is morally allowable to perform an act that has at least two effects provided all four of the following conditions are met. So in other words, when we do something, we may intend to do the thing and, it, and the action will do it and it's morally okay to do the thing but there's something sort of else that will happen because of it, directly because of it, right? So think again in, in terms of um, if they were to remove her uterus, her intention would be to, uh, to save her life or keep it from rupturing, but it would also have the side effect of killing the child, but she didn't directly will to kill the child, okay? All right, so, so here's the four things. The first is that the thing you wanna do must be good in itself. All right, so, so the end, your intention, what you wanna do has to be a good thing. And the intent of the agent uh, has to be to achieve that good effect and to avoid the evil effect as much as possible. The evil effect must not be directly willed, but only permitted. All right, and we'll talk about why that matters in just a second. This is the case, even if the evil effect is foreseen. All right, so, so it might be that we choose to do something and even we know that there's an evil consequence to do it, we still choose it because of the good that, that will happen simultaneously with it. So I keep saying uh, simultaneously because of the fourth point, but the third point is the good effect is proportional to the bad effect, okay? So in other words, there's a, there's a moral sort of, I won't say equivalency, but they're on the same level, right? Um, and then fourth, the good effect must follow directly from the action and not a result of the harmful effect. Yes, Connor. Yes. Yeah, I think I said intention, but yes, it's the object. Yep. So it's 
So, so the object was in, in this case, and we, we can go ahead and look at it. Um, and then the, the object is to, to save, is to remove her uterus or to, to remove the fibroid, sorry, um, or to remove the effects of the fibroid. Okay, so let's look at her three things and then sort of unpack it. All right, the first is terminate the pregnancy via direct abortion and remove the fibroid. All right, so, so the, uh, the object uh, is to remove the fibroid, right? But the means for removing the fibroid is to directly kill the child through abortion. So where does that fail? Um, so, Yeah, so the object is the, the actual thing that's being done. Yeah, so, so it would, could fail number one, but it definitely fails number four, right? So, so someone might say, I'm just trying to remove the fibroid. Um, so what, what happens is that the abortion becomes a means by which she's saved. And that ultimately is why it's, why it's wrong, All right? So, so that from the evil comes, the good follows directly from the evil, all right? Now, uh, assuming, uh, so we'll look at number two. So number two is have a hysterectomy that removes her uterus, all right? So she would be morally justified in doing that. She could have done that, right? Because what is she, what's the object? To remove the uterus, what's her intent? To save her life, right? Does the saving of her life uh, come about because the child also is harmed? No, right? So she could have done that, morally speaking, and, and been justified by the principle of double effect. So the object is good, the intent is good, uh, the good effect, the saving of her life is proportional to the bad effect, the, the unintended death of the child, and the good effect doesn't follow directly from the bad effect. They're, they happen sort of coterminously. All right, so she could have done that. Yeah, I mean, you could make a you could make a, an argument like that, but assuming that there is and she's going to bleed out, um, which would kill her and the child, it's not unreasonable to think, okay, this would be the best way to do this. Um, Uh, yeah, uh, in some respects, yes. Although in this case, like from a medical standpoint, three was a long shot um, for her, like for her own. Um, and ultimately that part, that judgment, she was wrong. Like it did end up, uh, she got an infection and it ruptured after the child was born and she died. Um, so, um, so three obviously is what she chose, um, but it's important uh, to sort of look at her moral decision making, and we'll talk about why this is important maybe at the end. Um, although she was under no moral obligation to do number three, she decided she'd rather have the evil happen to her than to her child. Okay, and so this that's a that's a legitimate way for us to begin to think about things, right? Especially as more and more complicated cases are going to come up um, in our lives because of the state of the world that it is far better, far better to have an evil done to you than to actually participate in an evil, even if you don't directly intend the evil. Yes? So are you saying it's better for her to do that? Or so are you saying it's better for her to do number three because out of, I guess, out of divine charity or out of her mother's love? Or are you saying it's better for her to do number three because number two would have been cooperating in um, I would not. I would not go so far as to say that it's cooperating in an evil, right? Like she didn't. Uh, she neither willed that nor, uh, which we're going to get to cooperation in a second. Um, the the fact is is that she chose the third because rather than than even worry about it from a moral standpoint, she would much rather the evil be upon her than upon her child. 
right, which is totally selfless, right? Um, okay. Um, did somebody else have their hand up? All right, so now we're leaning towards um, what Connor already mentioned is the principle of cooperation. All right, so what this principle basically does is recognizes that a number of people are directly or indirectly participate in bringing about something, bringing about an action or an evil action in particular in this case, right? Um, and so it, this, what it does is kind of helps us to navigate that and to guide our moral reasoning so that we don't knowingly um, and willingly assist in bringing about some evil. Um, and so we, what I want to do is make a distinction between uh, what we'll call like the actor, the person doing the thing, and the cooperator, the person who somehow um, assists the other person in doing it. So, so cooperation in a moral theology standpoint is not like somebody who shares the, um, like shares the act with you. So it's not like Bonnie and Clyde, like that kind of thing, right? Like it's more like, um, you know, me and uh, me, my Nike shoes and a sweatshop. Like what, what is my moral responsibility when it comes to my Nike shoes? All right, so somehow I'm cooperating that evil because I'm wearing my Nike shoes. Um, so what is my level of culpability uh, for determining how much, uh, how much I've cooperated with that? Okay, so, so think more in terms of like the principal actor and then the people that cooperate somehow bringing that about, okay? And, and like the classic example is, you know, like, Starbucks gives money to Planned Parenthood. I buy a cup of milk. I, I buy, you know, coffee from Starbucks. Am I cooperating with the evil that is, uh, that is, so I say Starbucks. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. Or just paying taxes. Uh, what were you going to say, Connor? I know there's, there's only, uh, so there, there's that example. Is there another, I guess, is it called cooperation? Is, that, is it called cooperation where you said that the, take, take the Nike shoes example, taking out the whole, I give money to Nike, Nike then, you know, it, it is just wrong, you know, somebody in a sweatshop made the shoe, I'm now wearing it. Yeah, so we're going to talk, we'll come back to that example in a second, um, because there's another principle that in order to answer that question correctly, that we have to look at. Um, but there are, there are people in the church that think all you have to look at is the principle of cooperation. Which has created a mess for a lot of people. So let's, let's look at the principle of cooperation first. Um, so there's, there's a distinction between what's called formal cooperation and material cooperation. So formal cooperation assumes that you've aligned your will with, the, that the cooperator has aligned his will with the, uh, with the person doing the act. So uh, the, the doctor who works at Planned Parenthood, who is personally opposed to abortion, but has to just provide, uh, but thinks that you know, he can still provide abortion. Well, his will is to provide abortion, even if he doesn't you know, technically uh, you know, do the abortion or whatever, like he, he's formally cooperating with Planned Parenthood, right? But the janitor, who may be opposed to abortion and all he does is sweep the floors at night. Well, that's probably not the best example because it's probably not the cleanest places, but he's cleaning the place, which in some way makes it easier for them to perform abortions, which somehow assists, but his cooperation is material in that it gives them the ability to do that, but it clearly is remote, right? So he hasn't aligned his will with it, and he's somehow removed from it, right? They could still perform the action without him, even though he somehow assists in it. Okay, yes. I think in the janitor example, it would be important to look at it because you could say you could have a you know, super focused janitor. Yeah, that's what I mean. Like he, he may be opposed to abortion. I think I said that at the beginning. He's opposed to abortion, but he works there because it's the only place he can go to um, get, work. get work or something, right? Or it, you know, it's the only place he can do it uh, where he can work at night. Some reason, right? That's other than the fact that, you know, he wants to help Planned Parenthood in their mission of providing stellar women's health care. Um, okay, so, so the distinction and sort of we understand, right? Um, and we can, we can talk about a very relevant example at the end. One last point that really is really important. 
So this is the principle of cooperation in evil. That's really what it's called. Guess what we never have an obligation to do? Cooperate in evil. So in all of this, I could say, nope, not for me, done. I am not obligated to do whatever you want it is that you want me to do. There's never an obliga obligation, regardless of whether you're morally culpable or not, to cooperate in evil. You could choose not to. You could, well, yeah, yeah. so you render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. So you render the amount that's just, right? You can always choose not to, right? You're going to suffer consequences for it, right? You're going to suffer consequences for not paying your taxes. But you could go, you know what? The, the amount of evil here, you, there's no obligation to pay taxes. Or to just, there's an obligation to pay whatever the just amount is. Whatever, I don't know what that would be, but but you would not be obligated to pay beyond that. So even like a simple thing, like technically, like this probably, uh, this, I have a tough time. I am not obligated in justice to pay taxes that go towards public schools because I don't use them. Okay, I'm sure you do. It's, pay, it's paying your, your salary, buddy. Go ahead, what were you gonna say? Oh. <laughs> what were you gonna say, Connor? No, so he, you are never obligated to participate in evil. He would, there would be no moral. Now, might he choose to, and might he be remain guiltless? Yes, that's see, this is the thing, right? He, there's no guilt there if he does, but it's meritorious if he doesn't. So, so then, then this is why we look at consequences. We're like, okay, what is the evil that will come if I don't feed my, if I can't feed my family, right? Versus the evil of remaining unstained by the sin of abortion. What if I'm just, I am totally opposed to the fact that I'm feeding my money, my family with money that came from abortion. I don't want anything to do with it, right? I, you're under no moral obligation to do it. Well, doesn't that, I guess that seems to go against like, prudence in a sense you say because otherwise it'd be like that that father might come home and say hey dad i'm uh, not working out there i'm gonna stay here yeah well that's a measuring of, of like prudence factors into it what, what i'm like you uh, because in a certain respect right and this is why we look through it, the eyes of faith like that think about like saint thomas more is a great example right like there were so many ways he could have gotten out of that. And every one of them would have been a little bit of cooperation. And he would have been morally justified. And he's like, no, I will not do it. You know, and I mean, even to the point he's making a joke, right? He's like, they come and he, the day before, and he goes, go tell the, the king I changed my mind. And they're like, what, what you did? And he's like, yeah, I think I'll keep the beard. Right? Like, he's like, screw that. I'm not being a part of this, right? I'm not being a part of that. Either. Like, this is really important for us to grasp. Like, because that's where God is, right? Like, when, when you stick to your guns that you're like, that's the hill I'm going to die on, you are perfectly justified to do that. Right. Yeah. So there, I mean, there, there is, again, remember what my point is, right? That you can never be obligated because we're, we're hearing this, right? And we can talk more about this specific example that I'm dancing around when the recording stops. We're hearing this, right? There can be no obligation to cooperate with evil, ever. You can prudently decide to and that, and you're justified. I guess you always could just say, well, no, I'm not just locking out of society. Like, I guess, I guess you said, it's really the better thing to do. Um, it might be at some point, like Rosa Parks is the example, right? You know, at a certain point, 
you may get to the point, maybe, maybe he works at Planned Parenthood until his kids are old enough to support themselves or he moves to another town or he, like whatever it is. And then he goes, enough. I'm not, I'm not letting that taint me. Yes, Ryan. Wait, that's not a, that's not a real thing? Okay. For sure, for sure. Yeah, this is all, I mean, it, it's dictated by prudence. But again, my whole point is there can never be an obligation when the question is about cooperating with you. No, because there is always there is always the, the, the fact that the truth is, like prudence would, would dictate, could dictate that the amount of evil that were to come from this is too high compared to the good of one man standing up and not doing this. Yeah, so you, yeah, exactly. So, but remember, there's also the suit on, this is why it's Christian, right? There's also a supernatural. This is why we call it like, that's martyrdom, right? Like in the end, like if you don't, if we don't actually grasp this, there's no such thing as martyrdom, right? Because on a human natural level, what St. Thomas More did was ridiculous. But then the soup, like our hearts have to be open to that and to an unwillingness because we're supposed to have the spirit of martyrs. All right, so principal cooperation, everybody kind of clear on that? All right, so there, there's a mirror image of it that not enough people talk about, and that is called the principle of appropriation. So hidden, the hidden premise in the whole cooperation and evil thing is, when is it okay for me to benefit from someone else's evil? All right, when is it okay for me to buy sneakers from Nike knowing that it was e they were manufactured in an evil way. So I'm directly benefiting from the evil of another person. Could be, could be, right? So, so, so here's, here's, here's a classic example of this. A lawnmower gets stolen and uh, somebody sells it to me. And I find out that it's been stolen, all right? I am obligated to give it back to the person that it got stolen from. Because the evil is ongoing, I can't benefit from it, all right? I find out that actually the, uh, the lawnmower was John Deere's and he died in 1920 and it was stolen from him. Now, where is my obligation? Who is my obligation to? All right, well, at a certain point you go, okay, well, you know, that was an evil. You're not, you're, you're no longer direct. It's passed hands through 30 people. You're no longer directly benefiting from an ongoing evil. All right, so the, the person who's alive, the deprivation of his, uh, of his lawnmower is an ongoing evil. And you're you are an actor in it by benefiting from it. Yeah, you could draw a line somewhere, right? Like you could arbitrarily, you could say, okay, well, you know, his son really had his, you know, John Deere Jr. really had his uh, eyes. He was really, really wanted that ride on mower. Um, and, you know, that was wrong, you know, because he's deprived. He kept waiting for his dad to die. He finally died and the lawnmower disappeared. And like, yeah, you would like descendants. That's a real thing. Like they do have a claim on it. Right? Um, and so this flip side of cooperation is always, um, when is it okay for me to benefit from someone else's evil? And, and the answer isn't, a, it's not a cut and dry answer. Um, but insofar as we can rectify the evil, return the lawnmower, then we are obligated not to benefit from somebody's, from an ongoing evil act, right? Because what we are doing is appropriating, right? Insofar as I could buy sneakers from somebody else, um, not to mention, 
insofar as the ongoing evil of sweatshops is going on, I am obligated not to benefit from that by buying cheap sneakers. Okay. I know it sounds like, I know that's totally like a silly example. Like it's not really a silly example, but it, the point is, is that like, if we really want to be unstained and untainted by evil, we have to, we have to think about that. All right. Yes. Yeah, so, um, so one of the things 